I hope you don't regret that, but <laughs> let's see. Yeah. So um, the, the title of this talk is uh, Beyond Moments. It's a, it's a technical term, moments as in, you know, second moment, third moment, and so on. Um, and uh, it's about a classical problem, robustly learning and a fine transformation. So it has some machine learning. It has an optimization problem. It has a new version of gradient descent. You're going to face a serious challenge. We'll overcome it with a combinatorial lemma. I don't know what, else, what more drama you want, but <laughs> OK. Um, this is joint work with Hergia, who will graduate this semester, and she'll start as a postdoc at Northwestern GTI, and Pravesh Kotari, whose affiliation is CNU Star. OK. Uh, this is what the uh, approximately. OK, so here's the classical problem. That's the problem. Um, uh, you get data, and you want to figure out the model. What's the model? There's a product distribution, so each coordinate has been picked independently. But after picking that, that's S. And then the data that you get, there's an affine transformation applied to it. So a point is picked with independent coordinates, and a fine transformation, a linear transformation plus a shift is applied, and that's the data you get. And your goal is just to recover the affine transformation. So we'll see a geometric picture in a second. This is possible uh, up to the signs of the columns. Uh, you know, because otherwise it'll flip the S. As long as at most one component is Gaussian. If everything is Gaussian, then you can't do it, right? Because a rotated Gaussian is still the same, exact same thing. Okay. And if there's a two-dimensional Gaussian in there, rotations in there, you can't tell. OK. Um, and so the question is, learn A and Z by observing samples. I mean, the Z is easy, right? Just take the mean of the samples. But the A is the challenging one in this case. It's used all over the place. It was introduced independently in many, so there are many attractive and heuristics that perform quite well in practice. So here's what it looks like pictorially. There's a cube. We start with the cube. So that's a product distribution, uniform on unit intervals. And there's a sample. But you don't see that. You see an affine transformation of it. Okay. So what you see is that. And you would like to figure out what was the transformation. OK, that's the problem. Good. And so um, this is the problem, learning affine transformation. You see IID points, from a, and you want to output an estimated affine transformation. And your goal is to minimize the total variation distance, let's say. You could ask for parameter. You want to find the A to within A, so that the error of A minus whatever A you get is small in some norm, and so on. But this is going to be an even stronger requirement. That basically, if you applied your transformation and you looked at the cube you say the original was versus the cube that that's the true one, the difference should be at most epsilon fraction. Okay, so the problem has been solved <laughs> a while ago um, a, a theory, uh, in practice and also in theory. And uh, one point of note is that principal component analysis does not work. Okay, uh, for example, if A is a rotation matrix, then the covariance of the trans transformed distribution is still identity, so you get no information. So like a rotated cube, you won't be able to tell apart from a cube. So nevertheless, the first step of their algorithm is to make the distribution isotropic. So you know, whiten it to make the mean zero and make the covariance identity. And then, this is the interesting step, find directions that are local minima of the fourth moment. So find directions u so that I'm thinking of x as the sample points that are given to you, and uh, find directions that minimize the, the, the fourth moment. That's a hard problem in general, but in this setting, with these independent original coordinates, uh, you can actually find these, well, local minima you can find approximately in any case, and you can do it by gradient descent, for example. And the point is that, okay, next slide, um, these are going to be the facet directions. The local minima are the facet normals. That's what they prove. Okay, and that's just a one-line proof, because you can rewrite the fourth moment as the fourth moment along the coordinates times this term that comes from the transformation plus a constant. And so the point is that if it's just a, if you think of this as orthonormal, as long as you're not Gaussian, this equal to three means it's a Gaussian. As long as you're not Gaussian, the local minima will be the columns. It's best to make U transpose equal to a column of A. OK. Uh, so, 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 this, this, so their proof is not just not Gaussian, you actually have to be not Gaussian in the fourth moment, so a little bit stronger. It works for the cube. Cube is not Gaussian in the fourth moment. Okay, 
So that's the thing. These things have been generalized to uh, you know more general you know uh, arbitrary distributions as long as they're not Gaussian, underdetermined ICA, and so on and so forth. To Gaussian noise. So what if your data was also shifted by some special kind of noise? But the problem that that we're going to talk about today is what if there's arbitrary noise? What do I mean by that? So here's the data that you would get from the true distribution after shifted, after, after an affine transformation. But you don't see this. An adversary arbitrarily corrupts an epsilon fraction. So they can take out some, they can add new points, whatever they want. Up to epsilon fraction of the points, they can do whatever they want. We will discuss the model formally in a second. Arbitrarily corrupted by an adversary. Can you still learn the parallel pipette within total variation distance epsilon? In principle, yes, because you only change the epsilon fraction of the mass. Okay, so TV distance is the natural notion here when you have arbitrary corruption. Um, and it would be the best possible guarantee because you could really remove up to that. So that's the problem we're going to talk about. Is it? Sorry, I think I got confused on the side. Yes. If it's Gaussian, like, uh, it would work, you just don't care, right? Or if it's Gaussian, like, everyone else works, right? Sorry, I guess, like, yeah, yeah, it just wouldn't be unique. The solution would be unique. Okay, but if you care about learning in TV distance, like then it would whatever. be trivial and, and, okay, and, and okay, not informative. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, you, you don't even need to see any points. <laughs> um, right. So, uh, yeah, so that's what's happening. So somebody has transformed the, an epsilon fraction of the points, and you'd like to recover still the original cube. Okay. Now, so here's the outline of the talk algorithmic robust statistics. I'll do a couple of slides. Um, uh, moments do not suffice. We'll see that. Uh, TV estimation can still be done. There's going to be an efficient algorithm, a near optimal error, a combinatorial lemma, and some research directions. Okay? Um, and I aim to finish by 11.45. So. Okay. Robust statistics, you know, this is a classical topic, but there's been a resurgence over the last 10 years. There's been a, uh, you know, several workshops here at the Simons uh, Institute, but the question is just you want to estimate statistical quantities, but some of your data is not from the distribution you're trying to estimate, rather it's been arbitrarily corrupted. Okay. Uh, it's turned into a very nice uh, field. Um, um, and you still want to, so the point is you want to estimate the underlying model despite arbitrary corruptions, learning sometimes agnostic. Uh, right. And uh, this, is a, this is challenging because, you know, even simple things like the mean are totally affected by changing a tiny fraction, one point. So, uh, so that's the, that's the that's the overall problem. There are many interesting problems, of course. You can ask for estimating basic quantities like mean and covariance. You can estimate, try to ask for Gaussian, a mixture of Gaussians, a hidden Markov model, and so on. And uh, classical approaches are either NP-hard to implement computationally, or uh, their error scales with the dimension, as opposed to just the error, the, the, the fraction of corruptions. What you'd like is that the error should scale with fraction of corruptions. Not, no dependence on the dimension. Um, so uh, within TCS, uh, uh, in 2016, uh, there were papers that uh, showed that uh, the, so if you take basically a single Gaussian or generalization of this to nice distributions, you can actually estimate uh, it robustly in time in, in, with error depending slightly more than epsilon, but no dependence on the dimension. So dimension three. Dependence. And this is essentially the best possible. Uh, there's now a, a, a monograph by Deco Nicolas and uh, Kane, which describes this approach, but also lots of applications uh, over the past uh, seven years. Yeah. Uh, one of the culminating points here is uh, actually the problem that led me to this robust statistics question was, uh, uh, can you estimate a mixture of K Gaussians in polynomial time when you have arbitrary corruptions? You know, your statistics model is never exactly right. There's a bit that's not doesn't fit the model. And while the problem without noise was solved very nicely in 2010 by Kalaimoitra Valiant, those algorithms don't work if you have even a little bit of noise. Turns out that you do have polynomial time algorithms now, uh, even with epsilon noise. They're very different algorithms. So that's nice. Um, yeah, that's that's a quick summary of this. But here is something that underlies. Every robust statistics algorithm I know, the key insight is that what you use is robust estimates of moments, moments of, of the data. Okay. And in fact, from the moments, 
you can argue that the underlying distribution is fixed up to the error that's that you can't avoid because of corruptions. And this was already something that Pearson, when he was talking about single Gaussian moments, was hypothesizing, but it's now much more quantitative. Now, of course, given the robust estimates of moments, recovering the distribution is still a challenging algorithmic task. But at least information theoretically, moments seem to give you everything you need for all these, including the mixture of Gaussians and so on. Okay. So for, for Gaussians, of course, you know, it, it turns out that for a mixture of K Gaussians, yeah, you, you, you can do it with a finite number of moments. Um, and the moments can be estimated robustly. So of course, the natural question approach is estimate the moments robustly, even though you've corrupted epsilon fraction noise, estimate the mean robustly, the true mean within smaller error, and then use those robust estimates to recover whatever you want. And, and that, that, that second part, I'm saying in a sentence, but it's, it's quite challenging. Okay, but, but the estimation of the moments, at least, for a large class of distributions can be done in polytime. Okay. So this follows from Kotari, Steinhardt, Steiner, that constant degree moments you can actually robustly estimate in polytime. Okay. Now, um, yeah, as I mentioned, that's, that's, that's sort of the information theory and getting those part, and then you still need to go the rest. Now, how about a parallel pipette? All right, so we want to learn parallel pipette and TV distance. Uh, Let's say order epsilon rather than epsilon. So there's a simple solution. And if you think about it for a minute, you'll see that. You give, the, you give me all this data. Some of it is corrupted. And I find the smallest volume parallel pipette that contains 1 minus epsilon of the points. And that will actually be uh, uh, within 1 minus order epsilon of the underlying true parallel pipette. Now, of course, this problem, how do you find the smallest volume parallel pipette? That, that's a hard problem. You know, you don't know and so on. In fact, it's, re it's reminiscent of some of the early statistic solutions, like Tukey proposed the median. So in 1D, the robust estimate of the mean is the median. Great. But in higher dimensions, what, what does median mean? It's kind of complicated. Things like mean, median along every direction is not a good idea. You get errors depending on dimension. But there is a nice idea, which is you find a a minimum volume ellipsoid that contains, say, half the points. If you could do that, that mean of that is a great estimate. And, and also, now that's, of course, how, to, how do you find a minimum volume ellipsoid that contains half the points? It's similar to this. How do you find a minimum volume parallel pipe that contains 1 minus epsilon? OK, so let's take a simple problem. Forget about a fine transformation. All I'm going to do is a shift. I've got a cube. It stays a cube, standard cube, but it's shifted. I don't tell you what the shift is. and your points are going to be corrupted, epsilon fraction. Okay. Now this should be easy, right? All you need to estimate is the mean. So if you didn't have corruptions, you just estimate the sample mean. You're done. But you have corruptions. But that's kind of the basic problem we solved in robust statistics, right? So estimate the mean robustly. It doesn't work. You see, because um, if I shift the mean by an epsilon distance. And in every coordinate, that could be epsilon over square root d. It's a diagonal shift, right? Epsilon over square root d. The no L2 norm is epsilon. The total variation distance is epsilon times square root d. Because in every coordinate, I've lost epsilon over root d of the mass. And there are d coordinates. So the overlap between these two is only 1 minus, is, is only one minus epsilon root d. Right? So the, the total variation distance is huge. So if you give me somebody that's shifted by epsilon, you could be totally off. Totally. We've got the wrong cube, yes. But the point is somehow, like, if you knew how to rotate, then it would be OK, right? So there's no rotation. No, no, no. If you, if you, if you changed your uh, coordinates so that it's not a diagonal shift, you rotate your coordinate system, then you're only moving along one direction. Yes. Yeah, because we don't know, of course, which direction was moved. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, but it kind of hints at finding the direction, right? Because isn't that what, to some extent, these filtering algorithms do? Is, is there something? Well, they're, they're the nice thing about, about in, in the Gaussian setting of sort, you can, you, so you can estimate the mean with an L2 distance epsilon. You don't care. It's basis independent, right? And, and also normalized L2 distance and so on. Here, the trouble is that there is an underlying basis that we don't know about. And with respect to that basis, L2 distance can be terrible. Yeah, and right. there is no way of finding. No, I mean, that's part of the problem. Yeah. You want to figure out that basis, right? And yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, in this case, we even know the basis, but we don't know which shift. I'm telling you the cube is given to you and only thing you're doing is shifting. Yeah. Right. So uh, that's the challenge. And same thing with rotation. Uh, if I rotate uh, even by an epsilon, uh, then, uh, then the TV distance shoots up to epsilon times D. Okay. So now the point is that moments actually do not probably not su suffice because for any constant degree, actually degree up to log D over log log D, the moments will stay close, what you would get from errors. Epsilon. But, uh, but, but meanwhile, the TV distance is huge. So moments just don't have information theoretically uh, enough content to tell you the answer. Whereas for without noise, moments are great. You're in fourth moment, done. And in the Gaussian mixtures case, you know, K moments. So there's an interesting problem here, right? We need a new algorithm. Yes. So, so just checking. So you're saying even all the cross movements. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. The, the, the degree, yeah. It the matter. full tensor. Excess I give you the entire tensor. tensor. Is close. The, okay. I give you the tensor up to log D or little o log D or log log D. And... Yes. You, just, you can just compute it and check. Yeah. Okay. So we need a new certificate of what it means to be close. Okay. So let's take uh, the simple case again. Shift, but I'll, I'll also throw in diagonal scaling. You're allowed to, to, to shift, but also scale individual coordinates. It can become a box. So first thing to note is that certainly the total variation distance between the true uh, uh, box and your box, any other box, is at most the sum of the distances along every marginal. So if I just bound the total variation distance along every marginal, that's just a like union bound. It's an upper bound. OK. Um, and uh, yeah, because in any one coordinate, because these are just intervals, you can say that the total variation distance is basically the mean divided by the by the standard deviation. So, you know, if you shift, if if, this, if, the, if, the, if they were all the same standard deviation, say unit, then it would be uh, uh, as much as the mean shift. So let's just assume that the that the standard deviations are one, no scaling. So now what it's saying is that it's sufficient to estimate. The, the, the mean shift, not in L2 norm, but in L1 norm, because that would bound the distance. You want epsilon error in L1 norm. That's impossible in general. You can't do it, for example. It's just not possible. Epsilon corruptions can make the L1 error. Epsilon will be. So here's, what, here's the algorithm. It's, it's very simple. You want to build up, but the algorithm is simple. Uh, you start with a coarse approximation. Along every coordinate, you know, take an interval that contains a little bit more than half, double it. That will contain almost all in the entire data set and do that in, along every coordinate that you start with that. You will be within TV distance, you know, that will contain almost all the points, but you might be very big. And now, let me put the figures up. There are just two things, two operations that will repeat iteratively. The first operation is we try to move. So this is your estimate of the box. That's the true box. This is your estimate because you just doubled something to make sure you catch most of the points. Along every coordinate, you try to shift down if you can. What's your rule for shifting down? You look at a small interval of thickness about, thickness about epsilon over d, and you see if the density, there, the fraction of points there, is much smaller than what you would expect in the cube. In the cube, it's uniform, right? A th thickness, thickness t should have points about t. Here, you're checking if it's less than that by some big constant. Okay? Two, say. If it's less than half what it should be. If it is, then you move in. And you do that separately for every coordinate. If your density is less than a constant factor times what you expect it to be, where it the true cube, you move in. That's the first use. The second one, and this is crucial, you look at the intersection of these slabs pairwise, just two slabs at a time. Now, in there, if you were the true cube, there would be only an epsilon square. I mean, if there was, an, if there was a delta fraction here and a delta fraction here, the intersection would have only delta squared because we're talking about the uniform distribution. So if you find that the density is too high, say more than, 10 times what you expect it to be, then there must be noise. Throw out all of them. Just throw out everything. Okay. Another point is you're th most of what you're throwing out is noise. You might throw out a little bit of true point. You don't care. You have epsilon. You might get to two epsilon. So that's it. These are the two operations. You keep doing this as much as you can. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this while you can, and stop. That's the whole algorithm. And then you can guarantee that what you end up with will be four epsilon TV distance. Okay, and here's the, this is the entire proof outline here. Let's say for a second 
that your noise only affects one coordinate. Every noisy point, that means either a point that was deleted or a new point that was added has a label of which coordinate it's affecting. It's only allowed to affect any one coordinate. Of course, that's not true. Let's just assume that. Then in that case, the total budget for noisy points is only epsilon n, right? And so every all the errors that you make, every time you change the density by a factor of two, you're paying proportional to the amount of noise. And so you can't pay more than order epsilon n total. So that's the, and of course, what you're removing is order epsilon. That's just period because every time you remove, you're removing mostly noise. But this assumption is kind of uh, crazy, right? Why? Of course, coordinate of noise can affect multiple coordinates. If I put them in the intersection, they can affect multiple coordinates. I might have deleted it, but it, might, it still doesn't make sense because it could be in the middle of two slabs and so on. Okay, so for this, we have this lemma. And I'll write it down on the board just in case. You know, you don't care about uh, estimating affine transformations, but you like probability, I mean, the combinatorial lemmas, you can try to. <laughs> okay, so you have subsets of n, and this is just kind of the fraction, the relative size, d subsets, d won't matter, but some finite number of subsets. And the union takes up only epsilon n points. Right? The union of all the subsets takes up only epsilon n. And I tell you that the intersection of any pair is, is at most alpha times the product of the fractions. Okay, so every subset, if, you, if I look at a pair of subsets, the intersection size is at most alpha, 10, 5, some, some alpha, times the fractions taken up by these subsets. Alpha is greater than zero, and alpha times epsilon is less than one. Then the sum of the sizes of these subsets fractions of these subsets, just the sum is outside now, not inside, is at most epsilon over 1 minus alpha epsilon. So in other words, the sum of these subsets where you're potentially counting things multiple times is at most the size of the union divided by a small factor. So it's, it's proportional to the union. So if I think of this as much smaller than 1, it's, it's order of the union. The sum of the sizes are order of the union. Okay. So that's the lemma. And... Uh, this allows us to say that you can treat each coordinate separately. And your cumulative effect, you won't have thrown out much. Um, scaling, which I didn't describe here, is an easy extension. So I will put up this here. Now, to prove this comes down to a little probability lemma. And this implies that. So let's see. I think we have time. So the lemma is that you have S1 through ST. They're all uh, subsets of uh, n. And I won't even define the fraction. Let me just say that the union of Si, uh, the size of this is epsilon n. And uh, Si intersect Sj, the size of this is smaller than, divided by n, is smaller than alpha times size of Si divided by n times size of Sj divided by n. That's the condition for all Ij. And I think this implies that the sum of the sizes of Si is at most the union of the sizes of Si. Of course, this, this is the wrong inequality, but I divide by 1 minus alpha. It's not quite inclusion exclusion, right? Okay. And the hint, if you like, so This is um, uh, now moving to probability. These are just um, random variables, but they are uh, 0, 1 indicators. And we assume that the expectation of uh, xi, xj is at most epsilon times expectation of xi times expectation of xj. So they're negatively correlated by, by some no, epsilon. Okay. Then I want to say this implies that the sum of the expectations is at most 1 over 1 minus yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the proof will be will fit here. So. You should not need to use it. I don't want to show it. Okay. So that's, that's, that takes care of shift and scaling. 
What about rotation? This is more challenging. Good. Yes. Yes. Like if I told you, uh, there's this box. It has some hidden shift. You have to return to me a box of exactly the same size that has close in TV distance. Would yeah, I mean, if the box the size one? doesn't match pretty closely, then the TV distance will become too big. Yeah, I guess what I mean is if you're, if you're restricted to be like proper learning of this box, like you have to learn it exactly the same size, is that equivalent to estimating the mean and the L1 norm and therefore hard? Like, is the magic of how, like, how are you avoiding the hardness of estimating the mean and the L1 norm? Is this because you're allowed to change the size of the box slightly to like... No, it's because mean? of the actual algorithm itself. <clears throat> when, we, when we do these iteration where we remove stuff from the pairwise intersections, that heavily affects, I mean, that this, it's no longer just estimation of moments. Right, okay. Whereas those, those, those intersections don't affect the moments, but they do affect the L1 norm. Okay, okay. So you yeah. can't like back out some estimate of the mean. Yeah. You could try to back out an estimate of the mean from your new distribution. Yes, of course. So by at, the end of the day, the at, at the end of the day, when the algorithm stops, yeah. I can output the center of the box as the mean. Yeah, but that this works. is not going to be good in the L1 norm. No, this will be good in the L1. Oh, it will be. That's oh, the point. I thought you couldn't. This oh. will be good in the L1. Oh, okay, okay. What I'm saying is that if you estimated the original uh, the, 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 from the sample, I got the, the robust it. Yeah, estimate, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I understand. Sorry. Yeah. So, so you could think about yeah. this as a robust in fact, estimate. As, I, as I'll state L1. in a second, it is essential to estimate the mean and the and, and this yeah, yeah, in L1 yeah. norm because it's going to be equivalent in TV. Yeah, that's things. what I was wondering if it was yep. equivalent. Okay, okay. Thanks. I got it. Okay. So how, what do we do with rotation? Well, once again, we'll let, let's say just pure rotation, no scaling, right? No scaling, no shift. I just rotated arbitrarily. There's a, there's a rotation matrix I need to estimate. So once again, we can start with a coarse estimate. So that we can get by um, either a sum of squares program or a careful filtering, where um, basically the matrix A can be estimated by some matrix A hat, so that A minus A hat is small in, say, say two norm. That means that in particular, every column, uh, the, the two norm error is to square root epsilon. That's, of course, going to give you a huge TV distance error, but that's a starting point. It's like a warm start. All right. Uh, right. Now what? Well, here's the dilemma. It says, so, so, so this is, I'm, I'm stating it here for, um, for the normal vectors, but it's also for the mean. So if you look at the total radiation distance between an orthonormal A and any other A hat, right? Take any A hat, not necessarily orthonormal. H is the cube. So it's, it's some rotation of the cube and some other affine trans I mean, uh, linear transformation of the cube, then this total variation distance is bounded between a constant, absolute constant, times the sum of the L2 errors, and it's also lower bounded by the sum of the L2 errors with a smaller constant. Okay. So the sum of the L2 errors in, in your vectors gives you actually the, the T distance. And so if you only estimated this to within epsilon, of course, you'd get epsilon times D here. It's too much, right? So it's not enough to do each one. And so we need to get this tighter. We need to estimate each AI within something like epsilon over D, much closer. And even if you estimated the entire matrix in Frobenius norm, that wouldn't suffice. Because Frobenius norm would be some of the squares of these would be epsilon. But then the, these could be epsilon root D. OK, so how do we estimate the rotation? So first, let's assume no outliers. It's a case we already know how to do, but, but let's, it's going to be a new algorithm. So we'll start with the co course estimates, and we're going to do a local optimization. So we have a starting point, right? And we know the true AI is somewhere near to this AI hat that I started with. I should do some local optimization, local search, right? Um, how do you do local search? Gradient descent. OK, one second. Yeah. So how do we do that? Right? We have to be a little bit more careful. Let's consider, so this is where you are. This is your current cube, OK? That's the true cube you want to get, so that you have this error. But you don't know where that true cube is. It could be anywhere within square root epsilon of you. So consider this cap. You know, you have this box here. Look at this, this half space. And there's also the complementary half space here. So S of A here and minus A for one coordinate. I'm, I'm focusing on this one, one normal. And that has a mean, right? S, so I've reflected this over here. And that has a mean here. That mean is telling you something about the region of error. Okay. And what you're going to do is use that mean to tell you which way to direct, to rotate. The point is that that mean is going to be, is dragging you, is dragging a hat away from a, so you should move opposite to that mean. 
And that's exactly what we'll do. We're going to shift A some you know, learning rate parameter times this mu divided and normalize. We're keeping it unit vectors. Because remember, this is just a rotation. So I want to keep unit vectors. So I estimate the mean of the difference and move uh, opposite that. Not too much, a little bit, right? Okay. And this actually converges. There's no noise so far. This converges to the to the right A. Prove me. So the, what we're trying to do is I have this candidate facet which is close, and I'm trying to move it so as to minimize the cap, whatever is sticking out. Okay. And I have that because I have samples. I mean, I get samples from the true cube up to epsilon error. And there's no error right now. So I really get samples from the true cube. And so I'm using this cap. And of course, that cap will be minimized if I rotate it towards the true A. And that's what the proof is. Say. OK, so this was great without noise. But we already know how to do this without noise. How about doing it robustly? So we go back here, same picture. We're going to estimate the same mean. Except remember, now it's not just here. Mean points could be anywhere. Because fra epsilon fraction have been arbitrarily corrupted. And in fact, this might be empty even in some cases. But what we'll do is that we'll use robust mean estimation. So within the caps, we'll estimate the mean of the set robustly. That's the point. That means that you, the true mean minus this mean is going to be is going to have a tiny difference. Uh, and that we can do. We, we know how to do. And this is a nice enough set. It's still going to be a convex set. You can estimate the mean nicely. And, uh, 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 and that, that's the whole algorithm. So this is the robust algorithm. Start with a coarse estimate of axes. You define these half spaces for each coordinate with your. Um, now, you have to check the density of pairwise intersections like this. This is all you have. The orange is all you have. The blue is your goal, which you don't know. You look at the pairwise intersections of these slabs. If it's too high, you're still going to throw out stuff. OK, no points. And now you repeat this, this robust gradient descent, where you want to use the mean of this, this, this region that's sticking out to move your A hat. And, but every time you do that, you make a little, little, little move. The lemma will say you, you make you get closer. You replace the deleted points, because you can't afford to delete so many points. You delete them for the purpose of estimation, and then you put them back, do it again, do it again, do it again. That's the thing. D log D times. And on the way, you will get all these candidates. We can, of course, test whether the candidates are good because we can get new samples and test how close it is to the distribution. And, and the guarantee is that this gives you an A hat, which is close in TV distance to the true one. Now, underlying this are a couple of lemmas. I just described them. That's the theorem. That's the update. And, 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 and the geometric facts we'll use are actually specific to the cube. So one of the open problems will be to try to do this in more general product distributions. We don't know how to do this. I really use properties of the hypercube. Okay. Um, well, uh, here, here are three properties. Maybe the first property is, suppose I have a hat you know, is close to the true EI within some, it's, it's some distance delta. Distance is delta. Then the volume of this cap is between constant times delta and slightly more than that, a different constant and delta. It's very close. Doesn't matter where you are because I mean that's not a non-trivial statement, right? If I if I do it in two D, of course that's easy because it's just a triangle. But if I rotate the slab in an arbitrary direction, you want to say that the volume of the cap, the difference, is within is proportional to delta. And we need to know the constants to to, to make this whole analysis. Work. So that's that's property one. Property two is that the mean in the cap is a little bit less than one, strictly less than one by this delta amount. It's, it's, it's actually, no, it's not one, it's a little bit less than one. And then property three is that the variance of, uh, of, of points in this, in this region is, 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 is tiny, it's only delta squared. So standard deviation is also about delta. Okay, so these facts together will imply that there is a learning rate beta so that when I apply the update, in fact, it drops by you know, you get closer to the target by one minus constant. Yes. Yeah. So can you say a little bit more about how you like get this sneak out this extra factor of n? Like in here, like you, I, I, uh, I thought the point was you need to learn like each direction to like L two error epsilon over n, but it seems like this sort of recursion would bottom out at epsilon if the adversary is like. Oh, we're doing this separately for each coordinate. Right. And uh, 
You're saying, what if the adversary places all its noise in one side? Right, right, exactly. Yeah, great. So, so what we're going to say is that we do this for every coordinate. The sum of all the errors is epsilon n. There will be some coordinates where it works. Yeah. And we'll just keep track of about d square candidates and do take the best. Okay. So yeah, good, good. And then and so that you make this progress. And now the general case. Well, remember, we did shift in scaling and rotation. A general affine transformation is, is has all three elements. We're just going to alternate between shift and scaling and rotation. You do shift and scaling to the extent you can. When it stops, you do estimate rotation, go back to shift and scaling, and, and go back and forth. And the point is that the termination for each phase of, say, rotation gives you either you've perfectly estimated the shift and scaling or you'll make progress. And, and so they, they bootstrap and converge to uh, the, the correct solution. And so the final theorem is that given an epsilon corrupted sample, arbitrarily corrupted sample of a linear transformation applied to the cube plus a shift, there is a randomized polynomial time algorithm that outputs a parallel piped a hat, small a hat, so that the TV distance is actually. Okay. This is a very different algorithm without noise also. Right? It's, it's actually gradient descent. It's not saying compute the fourth moment and that's giving you your direction. You, you, you start with some coarse estimate and you do gradient descent. Um, robust estimation needs to go beyond moment estimation. And this is sort of the first concrete problem that nobody does. And there's a different parameterization of robust estimation. It's not the moment distance. Maybe not. This will going to show up in other places. And a student Hajia worked on this for two years, despite mild um, suggestions that maybe it's time to work on something else. <laughs> um, um, uh, open problems? No, no, that, the animation error. Okay. Can, can this be done for general product distributions? Okay. General product distributions, which we know how to do. I see a without noise. We don't know with noise. Or is there some lurking hardness? Maybe there's some distribution. I don't know. Uh, so you know, one natural thing would be product of log concave distributions, for example. Okay. Um, but here's uh, one of my favorite problems. I give you uniform random points from an unknown polyhedron. So not a cube, but a polyhedron. OK? But uh, uh, okay. Uh, a bounded polyhedron, right? So it's some number m facets. And uh, you want to estimate the polyhedron to within TV distance epsilon. OK. And uh, the sample complexity is only order MD over epsilon. If you have M facets in D dimensions, this the VC dimensions M times D, so you don't need more than this. So information theoretically, MD over epsilon samples, so you can find the polyhedron. Is there a polytime algorithm? We don't know it without noise either, by the way. Without noise is open, with noise is open. We know how to do cubes. Maybe we know how to do simplex. <laughs> cubes are parallel. Thank you. Time for questions. So how important is the like the crude estimate? Like, can't you just start with anything and do gradient descent? Or yeah, the crude estimate does, for our analysis, at least seems important because the improvement in the error requires that the distance between where you start and the target is smaller than with anybody else um, by a big constant. If we started, in principle, at least I, I implemented this, you just pick a random direction, run the gradient, robust gradient descent or just gradient descent, it'll converge to a facet. It does that for polyhedra too. So by the way, here's an algorithm for general learning general polyhedra. Forget about noise. Pick a random direction. Okay. Uh, uh, look at the uh, go out up to the point where you have like epsilon fraction of the mass. Keep epsilon. And now uh, do local search to minimize the 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 the, the volume there. And that uh, the, variance. the variance there. And that seems good. So your one of the first things you talked about like, as a possible solution was to find the minimum volume enclosed in parallel pipe that contains one minus epsilon fraction of the yes. points. Is the problem still difficult if instead of general parallel pipe you just want to have a box? And I'm asking because of the first set of results. Yeah, you mean find a find a just a box. Yeah, yeah, yeah when that's you don't still, have a rotation, it's still it's still because um, the choices are coordinated. 
Yeah, I mean, we end up finding approximately that because any solution must be close to that. Uh, so, so that would have been a related question. So for what you do with your algorithm, does what, what are the implications on the volume of? Yeah, the so the volume is 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 close to the within within epsilon of the order epsilon of the of the optimum minimum volume ellipsoid. It has to be, otherwise okay. the TV distance is too high. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. I'll ask you a question. Uh, this is a very like nice and clean algorithm, but can you make it more complicated? <laughs> uh, can you uh, like can you do this with sum you of squares? You are really thinking the stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> can you do it with sum of squares? Like so. The, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. the first part, which I skipped over, which was how do you find the warm start? I mean, it was done in 2017 to estimate this uh, matrix A, but uh, that uh, the original algorithm, and even now, if you want sort of the algorithm, you can give in a lecture and prove it. Would be a sum of squares algorithm. Okay, to find so the to find yeah. the original coarse estimate of the rotation. Uh, but I don't mean the coarse. I guess I'm asking whether you can do the whole thing within the sum of squares no, framework. Not not clear at all. Right. Not clear at all. So there could be some kind of separation. Yeah. I mean, here. in fact, you know, there are these heuristic arguments that sum of squares is basically allowing you to do whatever moments can do and so exactly. on. Yeah. So either sum of squares is doing more than that, which it possibly could be with the right constraints. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then you have to figure out how, and that would be interesting. Uh, but uh, but no no not not clear. Uh, just to follow up on that, what is the difficult step like in terms of like uh, which which constraints <clears throat> uh, used by your stopping condition are hard to encode as polynomial? I mean any 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 of this. I mean I want to say that the pairwise intersection of the slab. I mean I don't know how to write a convex relaxation of the whole algorithm, but the pairwise intersection is not so large. That, yeah, symmetric. Um, so how about, how about a general SVP? I mean, just the problem you mentioned of finding the minimum of the ellipsoid. Yeah, that's anti-hard. Even to uh, approximate, yeah. I mean, with okay. the, if you don't give me, uh, yeah. Wait a minute. The, but that's the inner John ellipsoid, no? Or the inner points? Or, oh, wait a no, minute. no, there's arbitrary noise, so. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. No, so you could, in principle, okay. have to try out two to the epsilon and choices before you know what. The, the, the arbitrary corruption makes that a challenge. So if you could do that, this... If you could find the minimum volume... Then you're done? Ellipsoid wouldn't suffice in this case. You'd have to find the same shape that you're looking for. But minimum volume ellipsoid would solve the problem of robust mean estimation, let's say, for a Gaussian node. Please. Uh, along the lines of looking at uh, other distributions than this uh, uniform on a hyperkin. So are there like other examples of LP balls where we know how to do stuff? Because for example, for the L2 ball yeah. rotation, right? It doesn't make any difference. Right. So the, the, yeah. this be Great question, yeah. I think L1, so I mentioned simplex, but basically L1 ball, I think, but every lemma has to be done. So it's, we're missing the right proof. For, you know, so basically in the cube, I really use these properties of the cube that we proved, looked in the we couldn't find, I mean, maybe they're not interesting on their own, but about, about how the volume changes near the boundaries in arbitrary directions. You know, uh, how much volume, the mean of what you cut off, and the variance of, of that region, these things we would need to establish within tight, sufficiently tight constant factors, if true, for those bodies. So I, I believe that it can be done for the simplex, but there is not a proof written down there, and therefore for the L1 ball. I see, thanks. Uh, basic question I can't resist can't resist because it came up again. Sorry, so is it bidirectional in the sense that like uh, if you have solved the problem, you must have found a polytope on a epsilon n fraction of the points that has sufficiently small volume? Yeah, or you you would have find, found a point frac uh, you would have found a, a parallelopiped that contains uh, uh, at least one minus some constant epsilon points whose volume is close to the to the to the to the to the minimum. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you have time for this? <laughs> Unless somebody has. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we do. We do. We do. Yeah, yeah. Is that, is that? yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
if, if somebody else wants to come up and do it, you're welcome to also. So I'll, I'll throw, of course, lemma two first. And uh, what does that uh, say? We have to look at uh, it's the, the, the thing on the left-hand side is the sum of the expectations, right? Uh, so we've got to square it. And then I use uh, one of this crowd's favorite inequalities, which is, starts with a J. Yeah. So which will be what? Uh, it will become expectation of uh, sum of xi squared. OK, so far so good. And now let me expand. I have the summation of expectation of That's an equality. So, so far. So far. Equality. No. Just the narrative yeah. expectation. If you don't pull it. Oh, out. sorry, sorry. What did I? What did I miss out? Uh, uh, this, this square goes inside the expectation. Thank you. <laughs> um, I want to put the square here, but the expectation is on the whole thing. Yeah. Thank. Yeah. Yes, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> xi squared. Yeah. So far, so good. Uh, plus uh, i not equal to j. Um, expectation of xi xj. Good. And now uh, this is the same because these are 0, 1 variables. This is the same as expectation of xi. Good. And now I'll put less than or equal to the condition we assumed on the expect on the correlation, right? Says that this is at most uh, epsilon times the summation of expectation xi, expectation xj. I'll throw in the i equal to j terms here. It's a non negative random variable. And so I'll end up with expectation of xi twice squared. So now that goes to the left-hand side, because it's the same as the left-hand side. And so we get that summation of expectation of xi over i is at most 1 over 1 minus epsilon, because one term cancels. OK, so that's the, <laughs> the correlation equality. Now this, yeah, it took me one week. but. <laughs> I was hoping somebody. Um, now here, how does how about this one? Uh, like we just have to set up the right random variables, right? So let me pick y uniformly in union of SI. Okay, and let's define xi as zero if um, y is not in SI, and one if y is in SI. Okay. Now, uh, what's the expectation of xi? It's the size of si divided by the union of the size of the union. And then, what's the expectation of xi times xj? Um, no, uh, equal to. So this only is one if both it's in both. So it's si intersect sj divided by the size of the union. And now we can verify, because of the assumption on the SI intersect SJ, that yes, I know, I'm sorry, I don't want to distract you by almost falling. Um, is at most how much? Uh, alpha size of SI times size of SJ. Is this, oh, you can't see anything, can you? Yes, you can see something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, am I doing this um, too messy? Yeah. Let's just verify. Oh, right. Um, let's see. So I want to bound this using the assumption we made. I'm trying to write it cleanly. What is it saying? That this is at most um, um, alpha SI SJ. I have a single N. Good. And union of SI. OK. And now let's also write another union of SI and right here union of SI divided by n. So this is how much? Alpha, this is epsilon, and this is uh, um, expectation of XI, and this is expectation of XJ. So it satisfies the condition with constant alpha epsilon, the condition of lemma two. Now we apply lemma two by lemma two, uh, we have that the sum of the expectation of xi over i is at most uh, 1 over 1 minus alpha epsilon, because alpha epsilon is the constant. But what is the expectation of xi? It's size of xi divided by union of xi. 
So this is just saying summation over i of the size of SI is at most size of union of SI divided by 1 minus alpha epsilon. Right? So the sum of the sizes is at most the union divided by 1 minus epsilon. This is the epsilon. So I don't need to write anymore. <laughs> and uh, if anyone has a, a question about the algebra, they can they can do that uh, offline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll reconvene at one thirty. Now there's a lunch break. <laughs> Enjoy,